Many people ask, where was God during the Holocaust? Perhaps a more productive question is, where was humanity? God was in a voice that has been speaking since man appeared on earth in the words, thou shalt not murder. God was not a silent bystander in the Holocaust. People were. In this video series, Rabbi Nissen Mangel, renowned teacher and author, gives us his first-hand account of surviving Auschwitz and the death march, and how he heard God's voice in the most deafening of silences. In his first installment, Rabbi Mangel speaks about his family, their life before the Holocaust, and the events leading up to their deportation to Auschwitz. Archers nowadays is identified with the Holocaust. When I use the term Auschwitz, I don't mean particularly only this camp, Auschwitz. I mean, I myself was in seven different camps, extermination camps. So when, may, so when I speak Auschwitz, I mean the whole Holocaust story. <clears throat> but since it became identified with the Holocaust, that's why we mentioned the word, use the word Auschwitz. For many people, the experience, Auschwitz, Holocaust, shattered their belief in God. How can we believe in God when God permitted such atrocities, etc.? Ladies and gentlemen, believe me, my experience enhanced my belief in God. Not only to the extent I believe in God, I know that God exists. If I can stand here now, and speak to you, it's only because the help, the aid, God held my hand and took, pulled me out from Auschwitz to Matthausen, from Matthausen to Melk, etc., etc., different camps. It's only from my own experience, which I've seen, I feel, I know, it wasn't a natural phenomenon. And likewise, also, not only me, any Holocaust survivor that still the thousands of thousands of Holocaust survivors. Ask them that you tell you their own life experiences. Yourself, yourself will see as they tell you the, the stories that how did this happen? Is it a natural phenomenon? Is it something amazing, something supernatural? And let me be just like, you know, he, he, uh, United States, there's a Fox News service. Fox, how they complete, conclude the news. They say, we present the news, and you decide. Let me also present my own story. For each individual story can say, ah, oh, it was a good luck. It just happened, a nice coincidence. But the cumulative effect, one coincidence, another coincidence, and again and again, just like, for example, when you throw a dice. When dice will fall, the number six, you can say, you had good luck. How about we throw the dice a second time? And again, he falls on number six. So it's extremely good luck. How about it happens three times and four times and ten times? You start wondering what's going on. It is magic or something's going on. It cannot have every time you throw the dice, every time falls on number six. The same thing with also. The month and month when I went through this, all these death camps and I did survive so each episode, each thing you can say, it's a good luck. A nice coincidence. It just happened. But how about it recurs repeatedly again and again. So I said, I'll report on you decide whether this is something natural or not. <clears throat> Let me begin how we were caught by the SS. April 1944. It was Friday morning. My, the city was completely occupied by the Germans. My mother went out to the marketplace, not like nowadays. If you want fish, you can get in the store. You fill the kosher, you fill the fish. You can find, you get ready-made chont, ready-made everything, chickens and soup and so on. In Europe, in 1944, you had to prepare everything yourself. 
At six o'clock in the morning, my mother went out to the marketplace to get everything what she needs for Shabbos. It was in Kosice, Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> Seven o'clock in the morning, the knock on the door, my father was davening at home. My father used to go to the, to the synagogue every day, but once the Germans occupied the city, it was very dangerous to go out for a Jew on the street. So he davened, he prayed at home. My father had a talisman fill-in, and my sister and I were still laying in bed. Suddenly, did a violent knock on the door, and seven, seven SS Gestapo come into our house. That a list who lives in this house, the Mangel family, and they checked off each member. Where is Mrs. Mangel? My father says, Mrs. Mangel is now out of the house. She went to the marketplace. So the says, points to my sister in bed, and he says, now you get up and go fetch your mother. When this SS says to my sister she should go for my mother, I jumped up from my bed, and I tell the SS man, I want to go with my sister. He says, no, you stay behind. Do you stay here? I jumped out from my bed and walked over to the SS man, started to cry, and I said, I want to go with my sister. She was 11 years old. I was 10 years old. And the SS pushed me back into my bed. I jumped up again, and I cried very bitterly. I want to go with my sister. So my father says, why don't you let him go? Don't you see that the beds near each other, the clothes on the chairs near the bed? So even the clothes are similar. They always play together. They always go together. Why don't you let him go? So he says, okay, go with your sister. We went. We got dressed fast. Went to the marketplace. The marketplace was teeming. In our city, there were over 20,000 Jews. For in Europe, a city with 20,000 Jews is a large Jewish city. As we were looking, this, the marketplace was teeming, teeming with people buying for Shabbos. We couldn't find, we were looking, looking for mother, we couldn't find my mother. Eventually, we decided we have to go back. We can't find, maybe mother bought her and everything. She went, she went already home. So we left the marketplace, we were walking home. From a distance, we see mother with two bags of vegetables, fruits, and chicken, and all these things which we eat for Shabbos. We run towards her and we tell her the very, very good news that says came to take us. My mother became tremendously nervous. She says, let's run home. So I said, it's a little boy, 10 years old. Ma, what's our hurry? You are out. Sister is out. I am out. How do you know that Tati also won't be able to get some, some way, somehow, get out from the clutches of the SS? My mother wouldn't hear of that. She says, if Tati is going to Auschwitz, I want to go with him. And I had to restrain my mother. She was nervous. She was running home. I says, what's the hurry? Maybe somehow Tati will be able to save himself. And as I said, she wouldn't listen to that. So I told her, we had a, a big apartment house in Czechoslovakia. All the tenants were Jews, except the janitor was a, a, was a non-Jew who liked us very much. Their daughter was working in a tavern a catch me. So I said to my mother, at least let's go to the tavern and let's ask her. She should go to our home and see what happened with father. Maybe in the meantime, somehow he got out. So this my mother would listen to me. We went to the store, to the tavern, to the catch me. And she, uh, my mother asked, Erica, please, and she liked us very much. 
So she said, Erika, please go home and find out what happened to Mangal Bachi, to Mr. Mangal. He says, Mrs. Mangal, don't you see all these drunkards are here? If I won't give them the alcohol, the drink, they'll make a riot, they destroy the whole uh, tavern. Let me first serve each one, and once I'll serve the alcohol to each one, then I'll have a few minutes and I'll be able to run home. My mother was nervous, nervous, she couldn't stand, she was just jumping. And she kept on hearing, Erika, do it fast, do it fast. Eventually, after 10 minutes, she finished serving all these people the alcohol. And she went. My mother followed her to the door, and of course, me also. And as she left the store, came to the corner of the street, going towards our house, suddenly my father appears there at the corner. I jumped on my father and says, how did you get out from 7 SS Gestapo? How did you get out? She says to me, listen, now is not a time for discussions, of speaking, let's run. And we ran. The outskirts, we had a cousin who lived in the outskirts, and the SS were very methodical. They took the Jews very systematically, the inner city, a little further, further, until the northern didn't take haphazardly any Jew. They took it very in a methodical way. So we knew that we have a few days until they come to the outskirts of our city. <clears throat> we came there, and so I asked my father, of course, my mother, everybody, how did you get out from 7 SS? So my father says, we had beautiful furniture. During the war, before the war, my father, we were very, very financially very, very up, well up, well off. <clears throat> he said to my father, take all the furniture, put it into one room, after the Germans will be able to come and take this very expensive furniture and ship it to Germany. My father said, in Europe, expensive furniture, you know, a table had this beautifully, this big thick legs and table, you know, they carved out beautifully. Heavy tables, the break fronts have this beautiful carved out wood. My father said, I cannot do it myself. Impossible, I should do it. If you're helping me, if you'll help me, I'll do it. To bring all the furniture into one room. So that says, gives a punch to my father. He says, you verfluchte Jude, you cursed Jew. I should work for you. Now they want to plunder our, our furniture, but he, he should work for us. So my father said, it's impo I cannot do it. So my father says to them, so maybe I should go downstairs and get someone should help me. So I says, says, good, but you have to pay for the helper. I says, I gladly help, I gladly pay whoever is going to go downstairs to the street, find somebody to help. Ladies and gentlemen, my father went down with the thought of finding somebody to pay him, should come up and take the furniture. But suddenly the thought occurred to him. Rebunna Shalom, God Almighty. My wife is out. My children are out. I should go back to the SS. Let me also run. And maybe I'll find my family. And as he came to the corner, there we are. And again, you can say it's a very nice coincidence. If, suppose, I would have stayed behind. I wouldn't have gone with my sister. Now, logically, in a time of danger, when you're surrounded by the Gestapo and the SS, a little boy with whom does he want to be? With his father or with his sister just a little bit older than him? Logically, of course, with their father. Something inside told me, no, don't stay here, go with your sister. If I would have stayed behind, you can be sure, just like my, my mother said, if Tati is going to Auschwitz, I want to go with him. The same thing will also be, if my child is going to Auschwitz, I won't let him go himself. My father and mother would have come back. We have all been immediately, in April, the transport would go to Auschwitz, and it would go up in chimney, the smoke in chimney, just like other six million Jews. So we just got out from the clutches 
of the SS and the Gestapo. But what can we do now? We have to escape, we have to cross the border to Slovakia. Without money, you cannot do anything. As I said, we had, my parents, my father had a lot of money, but it was all hidden in walls with wallpaper. Um, should be noticeable. My father sent our cousin to our home. And as I mentioned, it wasn't dangerous at all. Only they took only those who had inner city, the outskirts, uh, the suburbs, uh, uh, the surrounding areas, and further and further. Then he told her, raise, raise the money, just bank into the wall, and you'll be able to take out a lot of the stacks of dollars. <clears throat> she came, and as she was climbing on her chair to bank into the wall, open up this little opening for the dollars, suddenly the SS comes, she jumps off, and she said, the SS says, what, what are you doing here? She says, I came to visit my uncle, my aunt. She says, the Mangels? She says, yes. The Mangels escaped. But tell them from the SS, nobody can escape. We are going to catch them. If they'll come back within an hour, we good and well. Otherwise, we'll catch them, we'll be shot on the spot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, but the SS, but the Gestapo just wasn't just a, a threat just like this. They did it. As soon as somebody defied, disobeyed any of their, what they wanted to do, immediately there's only one verdict shot on the spot. So uh, without any money, our nephew, uh, my, my cousin comes back and he says, they says that, said they should be come back within an hour. Otherwise, we'll catch them and we'll be shot. But there's only one recourse. Either go back and be taken to Auschwitz or to smuggle ourselves through the border into Slovakia. My mother's un brothers, our uncle, were living in Slovakia. Somehow, which I don't know exactly how, my mother sent over a message to, our, uh, to her brothers that we are here, we are in great danger. She would see it to arrange, we should be able to smuggle through the border. For example, from Mexico to the United States is nothing dangerous. But smuggled through the, the borders of Slovakia, it was in full, full with the SS, because they knew the, uh, the Jews are uh, trying to smuggle themselves through. It was very dangerous, so we should uh, arrange. Eventually, he sent somebody. He paid for it. <coughs> and my family, my father and mother, my sister and I were supposed to go across the border. But the neighboring people heard that we are going across the border. And they knew what's the fate of the Jews in Kosice. Everybody's going to go to Auschwitz. So they came to us, please take our daughter. Take, please take our son. Please take our grandchildren. Eventually, it was a whole caravan, not of four people, 17 people. How can we cross the border? We have to look like non-Jews. How can we look like non-Jews? He brought us clothes, garments, clothes, like peasants, like farmers. So he brought for us four people. My mother looked like a, a peasant woman. You know, in Europe, a peasant woman, you know how many skirts? It was one skirt, another skirt, another skirt. So many skirts. And that's how my mother looked. My sister looked like this. And I had a big feather, a hat, like a farmer boy. And it's when it becomes Sunday afternoon that we are supposed to go. He sees 17 people. He says, how can I take? First of all, they, they don't have the clothes as farmers, as peasants. But 70 people across the border, if the SS will see us, they, the 17 farmers don't go together, such a group. So my father said, I promise you, for each one you get another $1,000. In 1944, you know what $1,000 meant. You'll get for each one another $1,000. So he went home, he got clothes 
uh, for peasants, for farmers. And we were 17 farmers of peasants. But he says it's dangerous to go as one group. We have to divide this group into smaller groups. And that's we'll meet at the border, and then we cross the border. But together, it's very dangerous because the SS were looking for Jews who are smuggling themselves through. <clears throat> so my father, he says, made one group, my father, and four young ladies, then another group, and we were the last group with this person who was the guide to, to uh, take us over the, the border. And we were the last group, and he said, we should, I, I gave the direction, so many kilometers, there's a meadow, a big mountain in front of the is a meadow, and there we all meet. Ladies and gentlemen, as we were walking, suddenly the SS comes over to us, and he says to the, to the, to the guide, he says, I hear, we hear that many Jews are smuggling us through the border. Can you tell us how do they do it? Can you imagine we are themselves? How hard feet, how bound. Anyways, he says, we don't know. So we went further. Eventually, we came to the meadow in front of this mountain. The second group was there. We arrived. My father wasn't there. And the whole group wasn't there. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, half an hour, an hour. And this group didn't arrive. So the, 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 the guide says, we cannot stay here because the, the asses going back and forth continuously says, how does a person rest for an hour, for two hours, but not for so much, such a long time, it be, will become suspicious. My mother says, I will not move from here unless my husband is, is here also with me. She says, I promise you, you'll, I'll take you across the border to Slovakia, and next day I'll bring back your husband. My, says, my, my, father, my mother says, no, I will not move from here. As <coughs> so my, uh, the guide says, what should I do? So my, my mother says, it only stands to reason that he, uh, if he lost his way, most likely he went back where we came from. So he says, uh, so, so he says, uh, my mother says to him, go back to our house. He went back to our house. A few hours later, he comes back. Ladies and gentlemen, my father, because when he saw the Gestapo in front of him, so he made a little detour that they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't bump into him. And he lost his way and he went back. Now, all things just a little, little happenings, a little uh, things what happened. Then it takes us across the border, but from the, uh, uh, from the other side, from Slovakia, was supposed to be another, another people who takes us into Slovakia. He only, you know, from this place to the border. They did not arrive. They did not come. So we were there, we came, instead we, we were supposed to be at the border at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but this time it was already 12 o'clock at night. We waited, they didn't come. So this person says, my job is only to bring you to the border. From the border on is another people, other people are supposed to take us. How come he didn't get, they didn't come? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, uh, it's not my job. My father promised him again, he this time $5,000 should take, uh, take us into, he says, at least you know a little bit the forest. She took us into Slovakia. Ladies and gentlemen, as we were walking, pitch, pitch dark, 12 o'clock at night, suddenly we see from a distant, well, far distant, two people also walking. So the guy tells us, everybody should hit the ground. It's very possible to assess. Maybe they didn't notice us. And we should just hide ourselves, just go down, to, uh, bend down to the ground. As we bend down, we bend down to the ground. We saw that those people also did the same thing. So then we realized, Shalonu, we don't have to be afraid of them. We crawled for a, possibly a 200 feet, 300 feet, the ground. We met with those two ladies who were supposed to come take us two o'clock in the afternoon. And it tells, she tells us, you just don't know what kind of miracle happened to you. 
We came here to the border to pick you up. Two o'clock in the afternoon, recalled by the SS. And the SS asked us, what are you ladies doing here at the border? It's surely this must be you who smuggled the Jews across the border. If you would have arrived two o'clock in the afternoon, as you were supposed to be, you would be caught. I remember, what did the SS say? From us, from the SS, nobody escapes. We'll catch you. And on the spot, we'll shoot you. If you would have arrived two o'clock at the border, we would be caught. How come we burned, did not arrive at two o'clock at the border? Because my father got lost. My father wouldn't have got lost. He would have also been at the meadow. We would have been at the border for two, at two o'clock in the afternoon. So again, you can say, it's a beautiful, beautiful coincidence, a muzzle, but nothing supernatural. We were taken by these two ladies to their village. They took us up to the attic of their house. And we were covered with hay. They gave us a little, little space. And the rest of the attic was all because they were afraid. The assassins will come and search for Jews. So we were just given a little space which we were able to breathe. And the rest were covered with hay. Ladies and gentlemen, six o'clock in the morning. Of course, we couldn't sleep. We hear as the SS arrives at this house. They start to search this house for Jews. They search the whole house until they came up even to the attic. And they started to remove the hay. Can you imagine how we felt? Now, we'll be caught. We'll be caught. Remove the hay, stack by stack, moved. And if we were moved, one more layer, it would have, have found us. Three quarters of the, of the attic was covered with hay, moved more than half. And then they said, enough. We heard this, how they were speaking. One more layer of hay they would have removed. They were seen 17 Jews hiding in this attic. Now again, you can say, a nice muzzle, a nice coincidence. Let me jump all the way ahead. When we were eventually caught by the SS and Gestapo in Bratislava, which is the capital, and mind you, all which I skipped, there itself you can see, step by step, all these miracles upon miracles. Eventually, we got, how, when they, they started to take the Jews also from Slovakia, they took all the Jews from Slovakia in 1942. It was already April, May, 1944. So then, because for 1942, they, per, they permitted the VIP Jews to remain in, our, in, in Slovakia. So many people purchased the, the, such a VIP certificate. They're very important for the government, for the state, the big doctors, big engineers, uh, big lawyers. So anyways, it came 1944, they decided to take all the Jews from Auschwitz, uh, to Auschwitz. So we got for ourselves paper as we are non-Jews, different names, different birthplaces, different birthdays, different places where we were born, different names. One night, one evening, my mother says to my sister, do you remember your new name? Not the Jewish name, to the Mangel, a different, a non-Jewish name. So my sister says, no, I forgot. I don't remember my, uh, my name. So my mother takes out all the papers where we were born and um, our um, citizenship and uh, the birth certificates and, and she tells the name. And she said, now you, you remember good the names, um, uh, uh, the non-Jewish names. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
that night, the Slovakia police came, because they're searching for Jews, came to our house, and of course, everybody had to identify themselves and give the names. My sister was so self-confident, confident. Oh, she said her name, the non-Jewish name, and the police were very happy. And they left. We were all non-Jews, and they left. <clears throat> In the meantime, as they took Jews, Jews were went into hiding. So where can you hide? My father bought a beautiful, beautiful villa in Bratislava in a very exclusive, very expensive, very exclusive neighborhood where only very rich non-Jews lived with the thought that in this area, nobody is going to uh, suspect Jews are hiding. Eventually, some Jews in Bratislava heard that uh, uh, the Mangals live there. Slowly, slowly, one Jew, another Jew, another Jew came to us. My father couldn't send them away. So eventually, this house, be, instead of having five people, 10 people, it was filled with people who were hide, Jews uh, because they wanted to hide themselves from their SS. A few weeks later, of course, my, my parents gave away my bed. I was sleeping with my father. My sister was sleeping with, with, her, uh, with, the, with mother. And every, the, all the carpets in the, in the dining room, the living room, in the hall, filled with people who were in our house. One night, I hear as my father speaks with my mother. And what do I hear? My father says to my mother, somebody is walking in the garden. And then my father says, not only one person, I can hear that a house is being surrounded. Obviously, somebody informed that this is a house where Jews are hiding. The SS came, and my, my father said, I hear that our house is being surrounded. And as they are speaking, we are knock on the door. My father goes to the door, open the door, and they opened the door and saw that even the hallway, people are sleeping. So immediately, you know, this is a Jewish home. It's not non-Jews. Non-Jews don't live in such expensive home. Such a... So without asking a question, the SS gives a punch to my, in my father's face. My father falls all the way back into his living room. And the SS rushes into the house and says, everybody get ready. We are going. Ladies and gentlemen, we went to the Gestapo, the headquarters of the Gestapo. There in the Gestapo, we were like four or five days. They did not give us anything what to eat. The only thing which we had in this room was that in the corner was a sink. So that's what we had, a little water. But three, four days, no food whatsoever. Eventually, it was a Sunday. I SS comes in, or the Gestapo comes in with a black shirt and a platter and brings us a platter of salami. Of course, everybody after three, four days not eating would eat anything, wood, you'd eat anything, cardboard, anything would you eat. But everybody got two slices of salami. I did not, I did not want to take it. I didn't want to eat it. My mother started to plead with me. You must eat it. Otherwise, you'll die. I could not understand. That's what the chinuch, the education in Europe. Something is not kosher. It's impossible, like poison. How can you eat something that's not kosher? So my mother was crying. I said, God wants you should eat. I couldn't understand. What do you mean God wants I should eat trefer? I was all my life taught, 10 years. Trefer is like poison. To my system, something is trefer. But my mother was crying and crying and crying until... I ate one slice of salami. Said, God wants you should eat. So I, I swallowed this uh, slice of salami. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, it didn't take more than two, three minutes. I vomited the whole thing. I couldn't just uh, contemplate. I just couldn't, in my, my body, my system, just something which is not kosher. I vomited, and then my mother didn't force me anymore to eat the second slice. Eventually, from this Gestapo headquarters, 
were taken the first concentration camp. This concentration was still in Slovakia. They didn't take any number of Jews sent to Auschwitz. They had to have at least 1,000, 2,000 people, and then with a transport to Auschwitz. He was our first camp before Auschwitz. We came, this was in Seret, a few thousand Jews. They called out all the Jews to the courtyard, a huge, huge courtyard. And the tables were spread, long tables with baskets. It says, we know you Jews are all rich. You have, you women have a lot of jewelry. Diamond earrings, diamond necklaces, diamond bracelets. And you have a lot of uh, golden watches. Same thing, men. You have a lot of dollars. Everything you have to put in into these baskets. But whenever we will find you, you didn't give us anything, you'll be killed. And again, let me tell you, in Auschwitz, I mean, Auschwitz, I said Auschwitz is this term for all the concentration camps, all the death camps. For them to kill a Jew was less difficult than for me to, to, uh, to step on an ant. My conscience would bother me more, even a mosquito who bites me. To kill it would hurt much more than for them to kill a Jew. It didn't mean anything whatsoever. So, of course, ever that he passed by these tables, my mother took off her earrings and her necklaces and her bracelets, my father's golden watch and so on, everything into the baskets. A bunch of gold, of, of dollars. And then we went into our barracks. As we were in the barracks, the barracks itself contained, each barrack contained 500 people, 600 people. Each, everybody had, they inserted, not in Auschwitz, little booths, little cubicles. So we were together, my father, my mother, my sister and I, sitting on our luggage, there was no place where to sit. And Suddenly we hear an SS comes into the barrack, shoots widely in the barrack. He says, we know you Jews still didn't give everything away. You still have. This is your last chance. If you still will give it away now, it's okay. If not, you'll be shot now. And he's shooting in the barrack, in the ceiling, widely. As I'm sitting and watching my parents, I see, I look at my father as my father facially gestures to my mother. Take him, like take him. She should take me. My mother grabs him by, by my hand. She takes me to the bathroom, rips off the sleeve for my jacket, and takes out in Europe. They used to have the shoulder pads much larger than, than here in, in, in America, much thicker. So what did the Jews do? Instead of the shoulder pads, fill it up with dollars. So my mother afraid that they'll catch us. So she ripped off one sleeve, another sleeve for my jacket, takes out from the shoulder pads a pile of $100 bills, and she tears it into pieces, and she pushes down the toilet, she flushes the toilet. Ladies and gentlemen, little pieces of paper, if you, as you flush, the piece of paper comes floating back floating back. She flushed it, and every time she couldn't flush, all the paper should just disappear down in the toilet, but it kept on, the little pieces kept on coming back. And here this SS is widely shooting, and says, give, give, if we catch you. So just imagine, if my mother wants to get rid of the dollars, and she, she flushes it down the toilet, but keeps on floating up. In desperation, I saw my mother was perspiring. How do you, and she, in desperation, she takes with her hand the, all this pile of little pieces of dollar. She pulls, pushes it down with her hand down deep into the toilet. She keeps on flushing it. And then it, uh, the paper disappeared. The little pieces disappeared. As she finishes flushing down the paper, the, I mean the, the little pieces of the dollar paper, uh, suddenly the SS opens the door and gives a scream, what are you doing here? My mother says, my son has diarrhea and I have to come, I had to come with him to the toilet. If the SS would have come 10 seconds, 15 seconds later, what would we have seen? 
the floating pieces are little, little dollars floating on the water in a toilet bowl. Now again, you can say, it's a nice coincidence. It just happened. Let me jump ahead. We were sent to Auschwitz. I'm sure you must have seen these cattle coaches in which we were sent. These cattle coaches <clears throat> had enough space for man, maybe 30, 40 people. Here, they squeezed in close to 100 people into the, uh, every coach. But you mustn't forget, every person had also luggage with him. Because they, what, did they, what did they tell us? They're not going to be, are not going to be exterminated, be killed. We are going to Arbeitslager, a working camp. And you can take along all kinds of luggages. So everybody had a valise, two valises, knapsacks, and so on. So in addition to having close to 100 people squeezed into, in, in, into this cattle coach, also with the, with the luggages. You can't imagine what was going on there. There was no place, not, never mind to sit, to stand. Absolutely more than a sardine, a sardine can. How did I, where did I sit? I could have a little space like this, but my legs had to be on the shoulders of the next person. The person behind me had his legs on my shoulder. You just can imagine what was going on in this cattle coach. We were traveling over a day. They never stopped. A person also has to bother to relieve himself. They never stop. Can you imagine? People, elderly people, and all the, any, any person over a day not be able to relieve himself. Can you imagine the stench, what was going on there? Eventually, we arrived in Auschwitz. Before we came to Auschwitz, like 12 kilometers before, was Krakow. For the little, little openings for air for the cattle, we saw that we stopped in, in Krakow, the station. We saw, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning, we saw a beautiful sunny day. And then the, 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 the train moved on, we came to Auschwitz. Eventually, we arrived in Auschwitz. Before we came to Auschwitz, like 12 kilometers before, was Krakow. For the little, little openings for air for the cattle, we saw that we stopped in, in Krakow, the station. We saw, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning, we saw a beautiful sunny day. And then the, 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 the train moved on, we came to Auschwitz. What, how the sky looked, this Imtzashem, God willing, I'll discuss in my next session the afternoon. Anyways, we were taken off from the, from, the, uh, from the coaches, we were lined up. Line five per line, everybody with their luggage. And then was supposed to be the selection of Mengele. Who is going to left, gas chamber, crematoria, right, work. As we were waiting for the selection, the selectia, I was holding my mother's hand. I was the first in the line, holding my mother's hand. Afterwards, between my mother and my, and my father was my sister, and afterwards my sister. There was a group of Jews in Auschwitz was called Besonders Commando. What was their function? They had several functions. The, tra the, the, the transport arrived in Auschwitz, take away our luggage. Afterwards, the good, worthy things they sent to Germany, which I'll also speak maybe um, later. Uh, this was the f their first job, to take, every, uh, to take away the luggage for the Jews who arrived in Auschwitz. After what was the second job, those who were sent to the gas chamber 
shove the, the mothers and the children and the elderly people, sick people, into the gas chamber. Once they died in the gas chamber, this Besondes Commando, the, the third job was take out the dead corpse, put them in the crematorium. And the fourth job was take out the ashes from the crematorium and spread it Auschwitz, which I want to speak a little bit later. As one of the Besonders Commando, when he sees me, a little boy, as you know, a million and a half children perished, died, killed in Auschwitz. When he saw me, if they were not allowed to speak to the Jews who arrived, so he made himself that like he's looking for the luggage and tells my mother, for heaven's sake, Leman Hashem, give away your child, the elderly woman, who's going to be sent in the, uh, to the gas chamber anyways, and save your life. In other words, a mother who had a little child, not only the child was sent to the, the gas chamber, the mother also. So this Besonders commando tells my mother, like an undertone, he's busy looking for the, for the luggages between the people, he says, Put away, give away your child to somebody else who's going to be sent to the gas chamber anyways and save your life. Of course, my mother wouldn't hear of it. And I felt as my mother was holding the hand, the whole time we were holding hands, she started to hold it very tight, very tight. And then when, when you saw that my mother doesn't react, doesn't do it, she tells, says it a second time. Every time he spoke to my mother, I hear as my mother holds my hand very tight. The third time he says to my mother the following story. I'm not sure whether I should even mention it, but let me just mention it if it's too much, so I won't continue. It says, one transfer before. One transfer before we arrived in Auschwitz. It was a mother with a little infant baby. Of course, when Mengele made the selection, so this, this finger, this finger, the flip of this finger determined the fate of six million Jews. If you flip to the left side, they went to the gas chamber, death. Right side work. So ladies and gentlemen, what he said, he says, just one transport, two nights before, there was a mother with an infant baby, holding the infant baby. And Mengele, of course, just pin his finger to the left. She should go to the left. There was a whole group of mothers and children and elderly people and sick people who were immediately taken to the gas chamber. But Mengele was such a vicious, cruel person, even let the mother hold the baby to the last moment of their life. Even with this, he couldn't afford. As they went to the gas chamber, he separated the mothers from the children. And even before, there were trucks which were going towards the gas chamber. So little children were thrown like little bricks, garbage, onto this uh, big track, trucks. And the, the other people went in the other trucks. This mother wouldn't separate herself from the, from the child. And that says, give me the mother, give me the child. She be thrown, she saw what's happening with the other children, thrown to this truck. And she wouldn't give a Yiddish mama. She wouldn't give the child away. So the SS went over to the mother, kept away the child for the mother, unwrapped the, the baby, which is wrapped in a blanket, obviously a little baby, a little infant, took out a big rope and tied a rope to one leg, tied it to one truck, and the other leg to the other truck. And the says gave the command, the truck should go in opposite directions. This was the Baruch Habot, this was the welcome as we came to Auschwitz. And that's what he said to my mother, don't let this fate also befall you, give away your child. 
that the mother didn't give away her child. And Baruch Hashem, I'm here now. <clears throat> Eventually, for the selection with Mengele, now, I don't think I have to describe to anybody what is Dr. Mengele. He was the angel of death, it's called, a Malachamovis, more than Malachamovis. He was sitting on a table, like a double table, like what you have in front of you, two tables, always sitting, cross-legged, chain smoking, and everybody had to pass by. And yes, as I said, the turn of his finger, how he flipped his finger, this determined the fate. My father said, when he came, that he should go first, because my father thought maybe somehow he'd be able to cover me, that he shouldn't, that Mengele should notice me, and I'd be able to just smug myself in. But of course, each one had to go separately. When Mengele saw me, a child, a little bit more than 10 years old, and I wasn't very tall, he got off from his table, walks over to me, asks me, how old am I? I tell him I'm 17. I was 10 years old. Now, you know, you can, if somebody is 20, you can say 27. Even somebody, somebody, somebody 70, you can say he's 20. But no way somebody is 10 years old, a little, little, little. And I say, I'm, I'm, I am 17. With the hope, just like, ladies and gentlemen, you were laughing, Mengele was laughing. And he says to me in German, obwohl ich weiß, although I know that you're only 11, go with thy father, go with your father. There are still thousands of thousands of people who met Mengele. Ask if such a thing ever happened. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. But I never heard, and ask anybody. Mangala was just sitting on the table and said coldly, small ch uh, ch uh, uh, smoking uh, continuously, and with the finger flipping thickly one after the other. He had no time to get over because thousands of people were lined up to send to, uh, to a crematorium or to. And that's what happened to me. I remember several years ago. I was in Los Angeles, and I was interviewed on television, and I mentioned this episode. How did they describe it? Not I, uh, exactly what, what I told you, but they, how they describe it afterwards in the newspaper, which they saw it in television. Dr. Mengele asked him, what's your name? He didn't ask my name. But they described it in the newspaper, the Los Angeles Times, or the newspaper it says, oh, you are, you are, your name is Mengele? i Mengele, we are, we are somehow, Related, so you go. That's, but nothing of the sort. He never asked my name. He only asked me my age. And he says to me, go with your father. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this. When Abraham came out, Avram Avinu, you know, he was thrown in the burning furnace. And you know, he came out alive. Would you say this is a natural phenomenon? Some of these are burning furnace. The Neil was in a lion's den. When the Neil came out from the lion's den alive, would anybody say it's a nice coincidence? It's just happened. Any normal person would say, when a person comes from a burning furnace like Abraham, or the Neil comes from the lion's den, ask people who was Mengele, his power, the SS generals, the Gestapo generals, were frightened from Mengele. He was like a demigod. He should tell a little boy, for a million and a half little boys, he said, boys and girls, to the gas chamber, suddenly gets up from the table and walks over to him and tell me your name and go meet your father. This was not less of a miracle than you come out from a, a burning furnace or have come out from the lion's den. I went to work. This is self. How? The, very interesting. As I said, step by step, Nissim, Moffs, and Miracles. Eventually, I became very sick in Auschwitz. 
I have, since I have to go faster, um, they, they, they diagnosed me that I have scarlet fever Scharlach. So I was sent, there was a Lager F. Auschwitz was Lager A, Lager B, Lager C, Lager D, F. And Mengele made his medical experiments. As you know, somebody was sick, immediately was sent to the, uh, the gas chamber to be killed. Whom did he leave the Lager F? Mengele, there's a whole group of people, twins. And Mengele made these medical experiments on the, uh, on the twins. Why? By 1944, Hitler, Germany lost over 10 million soldiers by 1944. They were afraid that the young population of men be completely depleted. German women won't have husbands. How will the, the, the population grow? They want to be women without a husband, without men. So Hitler commanded Mengele, find out how you can make that a woman, when she conceives, should have not only one baby, should have like, twins and triplets and so on. So he made these medical experiments of twins. Any twin, whether it's a young, old, it wasn't killed, because then he made uh, experiments. What did I also see in Vlager F? This was the hobby of Dr. Mengele, a whole colony, hundreds, of little dwarfs, which I never imagined. I thought dwarfs, these little midgets, the lilliputs, only in circuses, and also non-Jews. I never saw in my life, I never imagined it can be a, a, a little dwarf, Jews. There in this Lager F, where a whole kind of grandparents and parents and children, grandchildren, with pears and long beards, Jews, little dwarfs. And then he also made experiments. I was in this Lager F, and Mangala suddenly comes in into this barrack where I was in Lager F, and he sees me. There were no children in Lager, only those on whom he makes experiments. Otherwise, everybody was killed. He sees me, he doesn't recognize me because on him, he didn't make any experiments. He asked the capo, who is this child? He says he has a, a Scharlach, scarlet fever. So he gestures to me, he should come down. And I knew what's expected of me, what, what he can do. So I wanted to show that I'm very healthy. He shouldn't send me to the gas chamber. And I jump off, I was at a double T bed, the double decker. And I jump off from my, from, my, uh, from my bed, all the way in front of, I land in front of Mengele. And Mengele says to the, to the Gestapo, get me a stretcher. He gets him a stretcher. And Mengele was the whole entourage with other generals, all the doctors with whom he made the experiments. He tells me, lay down. I lay down. He takes out, he was a medical doctor, Mengele, was also a general in the army. He takes out a syringe and he says to the other doctors, he's going to make on me an experiment. What kind of experiment? He's going to give me an injection. There are certain veins which go from the heart to the brain. And he wants to give me an injection. And he says as follows, if he'll catch, he does know where the vein is. If he's going to catch with the needle, the vein, I'll be, God forbid, paralyzed for the rest of my life. If it, he won't, the needle won't touch, won't uh, penetrate into the vein, but it gets in the, in the bloodstream, so then I'll be on, on the spot, I'll be kaput, finished. I understood German. My mother tongue is German. And I hear that Mengele, what he wants to do on me, these experiments, I jump off the stretcher, jump up from the stretcher, and I start screaming, experiments on monkeys, not on me. Now for you, it's very easy to hear such a thing. You just don't imagine, can't imagine who was Mengele in Auschwitz. Everybody was afraid of him. For any, the smallest infraction, anybody disobeyed anything what he said, he immediately was shot. He always had also a gun on, 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 his, um, on his belt. And I keep on screaming, um, uh, uh, experiments on monkeys, not on me. And I jump back to my, my bed, and I, kiss, uh, I keep on crying and screaming. Mangala, ladies and gentlemen, became white as my shirt. 
looks to all the other generals, all the doctors, what to do, what to do. They just look. I was sure he'll just take off his pistol from his belt and I'll be finished. They looked at each other and after a few minutes they walk out. I was certain he's going to send a truck for me. There's no cars in Auschwitz. A truck for me and I'll be, I'll be finished. And he never, not he shot me and not he sent me to the gas chamber. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the second time I came out from the lines then of a burning furnace. Just ask anybody what was Mengele. If anybody can't just disobey, not listen, not do what Mengele wanted. He made experiments and he didn't. Anyways, so again, you can say also again, it just, uh, that natural uh, happened, Basel. Eventually we were evacuated from Auschwitz. Many, many stories still now, uh, from now, from, from the, the second time from Mengele, till the evacuation, also incredible, incredible Nisim and Mofsim. But anyways, let me just tell you, we evacuated. This was called, I'm sure you must have heard, the Death March. People, hundreds of thousands of people went from Auschwitz to Germany. We marched up a mountain, down a mountain, up a mountain, tremendously cold, without any food. What did we eat only? The muddy, muddy snow, which thousands of people step on it. Muddy snow, that's what we ate. It didn't give us anything but to eat. And we stopped for a little while. We scraped away, we ate out of the snow. We had a little more time. We scraped away the earth. We found a little grass under the snow. We ate the grass. When we had a little more time, we scraped the earth, and it was a whole yont of a festival. We found an earthworm. The best steak didn't taste as good, and we found an earthworm there on the way. But anyways, marching, I, in Auschwitz, which this I skipped, I had, there was no children in Auschwitz. There was this woman were sorting the, 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 the clothes, and uh, the good clothes they sent to Germany, and also they worked out in the kitchen. So when they saw me, they gave me food, and they gave me clothes. In Auschwitz, nobody had anything. <clears throat> so we, uh, we heard that, the, 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 we heard that soon will be evacuation. So I put on for myself, put on like five, six pairs of socks. Why? Because now I, 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 have, I don't need only more than one, but what, do I, what will be the next lag? Maybe I'll be able to barter. Uh, somebody doesn't have a, a pair of socks. You know what the shoes, this wooden boot. To, so I'll be able to give him a pair of socks and you'll give me a piece of bread. And like I put on several shirts and sweaters, which I got from these ladies. Nobody had this in Auschwitz. Everybody's only the striped, uh, gray, blue, striped uniform. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, we were walking and walking for days without the food. I was completely exhausted, tired. I had to throw off all my extra sweaters, eventually all my shirts. My jacket I made just one young shirt. Then I threw off all the pants. And eventually I also threw away, because I couldn't march anymore after so many days, up the mountain, down the mountain, from between Poland and Germany, uh, the socks. Which I didn't realize, because if you have three, four thick pairs of socks, you need a much larger uh, shoe. So I got myself a heavy, that's what they gave me, these ladies, heavy German boot. So I remained, I threw away all the socks, was marching with this heavy leather boot. But my fissel was small. The hole for the shoe, for the boot was large. And as I was marching, the boot remained in the snow and my foot came out. So I couldn't, I couldn't march anymore because as I was marching, the, my leg was, my, my feet was very small and the, the hole of the boot was very, so what do I have to do? I have to push the boot. I couldn't pick up my foot because it always remained in the snow. So I had to push it. As I kept on pushing, my shoe, the boot, it wore into my, in my first it, scraped, it scratched, scraped away the skin, the, the, the flesh, until the bone. Could see the bone in my foot. 
Can you imagine the pain marching? Every time these boots scratched my bone, I saw all the stars, all the stars. I thought to myself, it's impossible I should continue. I should continue, it's impossible. So I thought, I just might, and but the, the SS, the very, I just mentioned before, a yakis, everything has to be punctual, exact. So the, a, a, a line of miles and miles of the th hundreds of thousands of, of people, but anybody moved out from the line, immediately was shot. So I thought to myself, I thought to myself, I can't continue. I won't be able to survive. It's, I'm just torturing myself. And so until I, I, I collapse and I'll be trampled underfoot, people have to go fast. I'll, I'll move away. Every time when I thought I should just move out and I, I'll be shot, <coughs> one thought came to my mind. Ladies and gentlemen, this is something very important. I'd like to leave, truly leave it with you. She remember this was a very important lesson. But I heard from my father, all of our shalom, a story of the Baal Shem Tev. There was a person who came to visit as chassidim, go to their rabbi. The person came to the Baal Shem Tov. He was there for a, a day or two, and suddenly gets a message from his wife. He should immediately come home because she's going into labor. And the midwife cannot do it herself. She must have somebody should help her. So he should immediately come home. When he got this message from, her, from his wife, he goes to the Baal Shem Tev and he says to the Baal Shem, middle of the night, from, I got this in this message from my wife, but I have to, going home to go through a very dense forest in those days. The forest is infested with robbers and thieves, murderers, I'm afraid to go alone. But my wife asked me I should come immediately. But I'm afraid to go alone. You know what the Rabbi Hashem answered him? Since your wife needs you, you should immediately go home. But you say that you are afraid to go alone. A Jew never goes alone. Everyone understands what does it mean. This person went back. And everything okay. So this story always I remembered. Even my most difficult, difficult times, I'm not alone. A Jew never, never goes alone. As soon as I made the decision just to move out a few inches, because I can't take it anymore, I mind this story, but I'm not alone. Ladies and gentlemen, after a few days, literally I couldn't continue anymore. I was so exhausted, my feet just didn't move anymore. So suddenly, a person comes over to me and starts with me a conversation. Now you say, a conversation in Auschwitz, in this death march. For example, if a boat is capsized, everybody tries to save his life in the water. Are you going to engage in a conversation? Everybody just thinks, how you can save yourself? But you don't want any social Contact, no conversation. The same thing with death match, nobody spoke to anybody. But only continuously think, how can I survive another day, another few hours? And suddenly this person comes to me and starts a conversation and find out he comes from the same city where I am, I, 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 I came from. And he's, was, he's one of those twins on her Mangalamit the, 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 the experiments. And I tell him, since you come from the city where I come from, I cannot continue. My leg is like completely numb from the top to the bottom. I'm completely numb. I can't move anymore. So I'm just going to move out a few inches. I'll be shot. And please tell my parents when you come back where I was shot. And maybe they come and take me back home to bury me. He says, no, 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 don't do that. He says, but I can't walk anymore. My whole half body is like para. No, I can't move. He says, I'm going to help you. He says, what can you help me? He says, put your hands on my shoulder and I'll carry you like this. It's unheard of in this death march. Everybody was thinking, how can I survive? And suddenly this person tells him, put my hand on my shoulders. And so that's what I did. 
and was on my left leg was completely out of commission, but I could still hop with my uh, right foot. So we had a few days going to the death march, holding on my on my the shoulders of my friend, of this person. Afterwards, my right foot. How long can you hop on one foot in the snow without food? So then I decided it's impossible. My both legs are almost out of commission. I can't do it. Exhausted, no food. As I made this final decision, I can't walk on any of my feet. Even with his help. Incredible. A SS comes over to me and starts with that conversation. I said my mother tongue is German. I speak German. I understand German. It starts with me a conversation. And after a while, he tells me, I tell him, I can't continue talking to you. I'm just exhausted. I can't move. Just let me move out and shoot me. He says, no, 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 no. He says, but I'm so exhausted. So he takes off. He had a canteen on his belt. He takes off the canteen from his belt. And he gives me to drink. What was it in it? Black, hot, sweet, black coffee. When I gulp down this black coffee, that he went through every sinew, every vein. Our, our sages tell us how will be the Kriyat uh, uh, resurrection, which is not due to the due of the revival. Ladies and gentlemen, I experienced this due of revival. When I took this coffee, the, the sweet black coffee, it went through every vein, every part of my body. And I suddenly became, I could walk. And he, I finished, he, he gave me this whole canteen of black coffee, and he disappeared. We were going fast, and we had to go. So I, I, don't, I didn't pay any attention to what happened to him. I finished, I gave him back the canteen, and he disappeared. For the next few days, every few hours, he comes to me, and we, we start always a conversation. He knew already who my father, what where did my study, father study, what was his business, who my uncles, my, uh, he knew of my whole family. And ladies and gentlemen, every few hours he comes to me and he gives me this coffee. And this gave me the strength. Once we came to a particular tall mountain, very, very cold, freezing. And I tell him, my, eyes, my, my ears are freezing, I can't take it. He takes off his SS cap, puts it on my head, pulls it down on my ear. He was walking bareheaded, and I was walking with an SS cap. One of the miracles was no SS saw that I'm wearing an SS cap without any doubt. SS would see that I have, I, they would have thought I stole it from, from my SS. And he gives me, and, he, and then eventually, after another day, he comes to me. He says, but even with all this coffee, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm so weak. And he says, just let me walk out and uh, shoot me and kill me. He says, no, I promise you, you'll go home and you find your parents. I says, but I can't walk anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, I was holding on my friend on his shoulder. And I says, says to me, I'm going to help you. And he carries me. I like schleppers me. By, by, by hand, my right hand. I left hand, I'm holding on, the, on, on with my friend. And I says, hold, schleps me like this for another a day. Then we come. He comes one day. Because he were, and after a while speaking, usually he would give me the, the, the canteen of coffee. This time we were speaking like five minutes, and he doesn't give me the coffee. I thought already I'm entitled to it. I asked him, no, no, where is the coffee? <laughs> so he takes off the canteen from his belt, opens it up, turns it upside down, and says, even the Germans don't have any more coffee. So I tell him, if that's the case, I just can't continue. He says, please, please, he was pleading with me, I'll help you walk. Six kilometers from now, by coming to a German village, I'll go to a house and I'll get you coffee. <laughs> so he carried me for the next six kilometers. 
and we came to this village. He went to that German house. He got the coffee, but this time it wasn't sweet anymore. And then after I finished the, the coffee, he says, please give me back. And the whole time I was walking with the SS cap. He says, now this time, please give me back my cap. I gave him back the cap. He went away. I never saw this SS again. But there's a sequel to it. But here some other time will continue it. If you liked that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.